Number 23 in your hymnal, page number 23. Find your place, let's stand as we sing. Page number 23. There's power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power. In the blood, in the blood, would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood, there is power, and working power in the blood of the land. There is power, and working power in the just blood of the land. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, one working power in the blood. There is power. One working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, one working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? Oh, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Power, power, one working power in the blood. There is power, power, 
one working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Well, good evening. There is power in the blood. Amen. Well, we've come tonight to partake of the Lord's Supper and to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that we can sing praises to God, that we can rejoice in the power that by which he has saved us and by which he keeps us unto the day of salvation. Where we get to look on the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and just rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I know it's been a long week. I know crazy things have happened. If you've had crazy things happen to you today or this week, say amen. Yes, yes. You know why? Because it's Easter. And this is that's last week, this wouldn't have happened. Next week, it probably won't happen. But this week, to distract us, to dismay us, it's happening right now. So please, let's put all that aside. It's outside of the walls. It's within the hands of God. And let's look to the Lord and rejoice in this time that he's given us to remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Let's look to the Lord together. Father, we thank you for your love and your power. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ by which we've been saved, through which we have faith or we have peace with you because we've believed and put our full trust and confidence in your son. And Father, we come tonight rejoicing. We thank you for all that you've done. I pray, Lord, even in my own life, that you would help me and all of us here to set aside all the external thoughts, the exterior things that are happening in our lives, and let us through you, sanctify this time together. And Father, I pray that our hearts and minds would be fixed on you, that your son would be the anchor of our soul and the anchor of our hope, and that we would reflect on that and rejoice with one another tonight. So God, be praised as we reflect on these great truths of Jesus Christ and give thanks tonight together as a body of believers for his blood and for his body, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Remain standing and turn to page 27 as Brother Barry comes once again. 27, 27. The old rugged cross. We rejoice to take a moment or even a service to reflect on the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And tonight we emphasize that theme, of course, in preparation for Easter and in remembrance of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross. And since this is Holy Week, of course, we anticipate the time many, many years ago, or we think about the time many years ago where Jesus Christ himself had his own last supper with his disciples, where he sat and spoke and and prepared their hearts for all that was to come to the extent that he possibly could to help them understand that in just a matter of time, few hours, Jesus would be betrayed. He would give himself over into the hands of the Gentiles to be tried, and then he would die, die for us. He would become righteous, or he would become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we, of course, rejoice in that. But we want to sanctify this holy time to remember and to cast away all other thoughts and to think about Jesus Christ, his body, and his blood, and what it means to us, not just corporately, but personally to set aside this time for just that purpose. And so tonight we'll have special readings, we'll have special music, and we'll have a message, and of course we'll serve the bread and the wine in order to reflect and remember these precious times. And so first, all right, we have a special we have some special music starting off tonight with Miss Lisa and Miss Rebecca, and they will be singing for us now. to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, 
to a cross of one. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the At this time, we'll have Steve Shepard come up and read a selected text from Hebrews chapter 10, and I invite you to turn there if you'd like to read along. He'll be reading the first 10 verses of that chapter. Thank you, Steve. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 through 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for the sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, 
thou wouldest not, neither hadst thou hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let's all stand to our feet. Brother Bear will come and lead us as we turn in our hymnal to page 29. Just first and last for the yeah, that's Page 29, at the cross, page 29, we'll do the first and last verse. First and last verse, at the cross. <laughs> Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Thank you. you may be seated. At this time, Quincy Shepherd will come and read a selected passage from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. Thank you, Quincy. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 21. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Forasmuch as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was or foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do you believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Let's all stand once again as Brother Barry comes and as we turn to page number 20. Number 20, two zero. When I see the blood, page 20. Christ, our Redeemer, died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. All who receive him need never fear. Yes, he will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Oh, what compassion, oh, boundless love. Jesus hath power, Jesus is true. All who believe are safe from the storm. Oh, he will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. At this time, Brother Jim Vickery will come and read a selected passage from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 53 through 56. Thank you, Brother Jim. The 
Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 53 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink of his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. At this time, we'll enjoy a music special by Matt and Steph. Your pure, unchanging word, life everlasting when I die. Your promise sure, I claim again. Jesus, my Lord, my God, my friend, now I am yours and I will stand. Sinless forever at your hand. Sinless forever at your hand. Thank you very much. Mark chapter 14 tonight. <clears throat> We'll begin reading in verse number 22 and continue down through verse 26, Mark chapter 14. And the scriptures tell us here in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine <clears throat> until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung in him, they went out 
and to the Mount of Olives. Tonight, my message is entitled, The Blessing of the Body and Blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for his body and his blood. And I pray that as we lift up our hearts to you in thanks and in praise, that you would fill us by your grace with knowledge and understanding of this text and passage. And Father, help us by your spirit to learn how we can draw closer to you, closer to one another, and glorify you as our Savior, as you desire and certainly as you deserve. God be praised, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There were times in the ministry of the prophets of old when words were not adequate to make their point. And so they resorted dramatically to symbolic actions. This was especially true of some prophets more than others, but Ezekiel stands out to me who on one occasion shaved his head and his beard which may not throw anyone off in our society, but for a Jewish man to shave his head and his beard was an absolutely outrageous act in their culture. And he divided his shorn hair into three mounds, and he scattered the winds, or scattered them into the winds to prophesy the future of Israel, as he recorded in the fifth chapter of his book. Now, few agreed with that prophecy, but nevertheless, that was the prophet's message that indeed came to pass. Jeremiah was no stranger to having a flair for the dramatic. He made a yoke himself and wore it to prophesy the Babylonian captivity, which he recorded in the 27th chapter of his prophecy. The prophet Ahijah tore his robe into 12 pieces and gave 10 of them to Jeroboam to prophesy that God was going to tear apart Israel and tear apart Solomon's kingdom and give 10 of those tribes to Jeroboam, recorded in 1 Kings chapter 11. Now Jesus comes along, who of course is the ultimate prophet of Israel, and with profound continuity and prophetic patience, he comes to the celebration of the Passover feast with his disciples, and he dramatically reinterprets the meal that was before them, and he instituted a radically new observance for his followers, something that he would call the New Testament or the New Covenant. In true prophetic style, Jesus combines word and symbol to maximize the communication of the most important truth for mankind in the entire universe, that salvation has come from God through Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, just how and when Jesus did this is apparent from the order of the Passover ritual, which we have recorded in Mark 14, just in part. When the meal had been completely laid out before Jesus and the disciples at this table, there would be a roast of lamb as the centerpiece, and the host, which would be Jesus in this case, interpreted by tradition each of the foods on the table as it related to their deliverance from Egypt. You would have the bitter herbs that recalled their bitter slavery, the stewed fruit, which by their very color and consistency would recall the misery of making bricks for Pharaoh. Imagine looking at that fruit and recalling the dark color of the bricks that would be made and the roasted lamb brought to their remembrance, of course, the lamb's blood applied to the doorposts and they're eating of that lamb within the house, and the angels passing over over them as it destroyed the firstborn of all of Egypt. Now, we don't have a record of Jesus' words explaining each of those elements in his own fashion, but we have every reason to believe that it went beyond anything ever given to that point in time. Because he was preparing for them, his disciples, and for us, his modern disciples, this new institution of the new covenant, the New Testament, in his body and in his blood. And with that explanation of those old-time elements complete, Jesus, as, as the head of the family, would sit upright from his reclined position at the table, and he would take the unleavened bread 
and he would pronounce a traditional blessing over it as every Jew was known to do. He would say, Praise be thou, O Lord, sovereign of the world, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. To which the apostles would have replied, Amen. Then Jesus would have taken that bread and then distributed it to his disciples in silence. And they would have passed it from hand to hand all around the table. And during this silence, Jesus shattered the Passover, Passover custom with radical words recorded for us in verse 22 of Mark 14, where he says, Take, eat, this is my body. And with this, the disciples began to soberly and silently eat this sacred meal. The earlier prediction of intimate betrayal, now Jesus' astounding command left them incapable of levity. The silence, though, was birthing an imperfect yet ascending comprehension which would, which would quickly mature in the events to come over the next few days. And when the meal was complete, Jesus rose again from his reclining position and repeated the traditional charge, speak praises to our God to whom belongs what we have eaten. And the disciples would have responded simply, praise be to God for our food we have eaten. Then with his right hand, he would take the third cup of wine in the traditional Passover meal, and gazing upon the cup, he would give thanks and say, as was traditional with the Jews, may the all-merciful one make us worthy of the days of the Messiah and of the life of the world to come. He brings salvation of his king. He shows covenant faithfulness to his anointed, to David and his seed forever. He makes peace in heavenly places. May he secure peace for us and for all Israel, to which the disciples would simply say, Amen. Then in silence, Jesus would pass that communion cup that common cup, and utter the words recorded for us in verse 24. This is the blood. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed out for many. There was a prophetic continuity in Jesus' illustrative use of the bread and of the cup, an immensely powerful communication. Paul would tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, that Jesus instituted this graphic observance for all time as a remembrance of himself. And that remembrance is meant to convey to everyone an increasing understanding of the mystery of Christ and the atonement that he provided for us. Now, we ought to keep in mind that the Lord's table is an acted parable. And to consider what the proclamation of that acted parable is. And first, we go back to verse 22 to consider the solemn meaning of Jesus' own words. Take, eat, this is my body, this would be the meaning of the bread. To begin with, Jesus was not saying that the bread was literally his body. Jews understood the figurative language and the prophetic legacy of parabolic acts. They would understand that the language was customary and symbolic, and it expressed what Jesus was intending figuratively. Now, what did this figure mean? The bread referred to to the life of Jesus Christ. The incarnation in Bethlehem, by the way, means city of bread. Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, took a human body. Lo, in the volume of the book it is written of me, a body hast thou prepared for me. And it's that body that Jesus Christ would offer after living a perfect life sinless and immaculate. He demonstrated his divine life to the entire world by living a sinless life in that body. He bore our sins on the cross while in a human body, and he triumphed over the grave by bringing that body back to life, and he now lives in a glorified body at the right hand of the Father where he prays for us without ceasing. 
And as members of his body, we share that life. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Our partaking of the bread symbolizes our very real participation in his life. And that is every aspect of his life, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, and his pleasant placement in heavenly places where Ephesians chapter 2 affirms that there we are with him already. And if we as believers are indeed believers, we partake in his life, that is, we partake in his body, the body of Jesus Christ. The bread also means that we participate in each other's lives. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17, for we being many are one. That is, one bread, he says. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are partakers of that one bread. So a second earthly benefit of the bread is sharing in the lives of other people who are part of the bread, excuse me, the body of Jesus Christ. See, the Lord's table promotes this communion of the saints. It's celebrating this, the occasion of Jesus Christ where we celebrate and share in his body and where we share in the lives of one another. There's a story about one old saint that would greet people as they left and said farewell to them as they left after a communion service. And he would say, brother or sister, as the occasion would, would, uh, would be. He says, it's good to see you, but I've already met you in the bread. And what he was saying in a figure is, we're all one with one another. I am one with you. You are one with me because we are one in Christ. Let us enjoy communion together and open ourselves up to one another and to be a part of each other's life, to see the bread that is the life of Christ prosper in one another's lives. We're proclaiming by virtue of being partakers of the body of Jesus Christ that we participate in the life of one another. Friends, be unified. Be forgiving. Love one another. Love one another. Our partaking is not just an announcement, but it's an invitation to others to partake. It meant to feed those hungry souls around you. Share the bread of life, that is, share Jesus Christ with those who are hungry those who have never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. They are famished. They are empty. They are depleted. They are desperate. There's only one thing that can satisfy them, and that's the bread of life. There are hungry people all around us. Share the bread. It's been broken for us. Pass it around. Pass it around to all who are hungry. As we have examined the meaning of the bread, we must pause to take, yeah, take stock of the meaning of the cup as well. As we'll read again in verses 23 and 24, And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. What is that meaning of that pronouncement that Jesus makes in verse 24? the blood of the New Testament that is shed for many. The redness of the wine in this cup represented Jesus's atoning blood. And it's being shed or poured out for many, an allusion to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12, where Isaiah speaks of Messiah who poured out his soul unto death. This describes a violent death. Many here refers to those who would benefit from his atoning death. Not us only, but he died and atoned for the sins of the whole world, John tells us in his first general epistle. His blood was the blood of the new covenant. The old covenant of the law at Sinai given to Moses was still solemnized by the shedding of sacrificial blood. 
Jesus' blood sealed the new covenant, whereby men and women and children would be saved by resting their faith in his atoning blood. Praise God. Now, as the disciples sit around this table with Jesus, and they are observing the contents that remain, they would see the bones of the Passover lamb resting there on the table and the aroma of that sacrifice filling the air. And and while they're still taking in this scene, Jesus' words confirm that prophetic declaration that he was indeed the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The cup is meant to drive home to us who believe the objective fact that our redemption, as those who partake and share in fellowship with Jesus Christ, we objectively are authentically saved by his blood. Jesus shed his blood for our sins. And the benefit of holding the cup before us is echoed to us from the Apostle Paul recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, he says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? In other words, as we take the cup, we benefit most by saying in our hearts, yes, I really am forgiven, and I rest and have peace in that objective fact. God has declared it. It is absolutely true. I stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But there is a demand that is placed on us by the bread and by the cup. Read previously in John chapter 6, verses 53 through 56, where we will read again momentarily. The reality of these symbols is so powerful. It powerfully portrays what makes us come close and be in communion with Jesus Christ, but it demands from us a certain depth to our belief. You see, earlier in Jesus' ministry, in his Bread of Life discourse, Jesus gave us one of his hard sayings. Undoubtedly, anticipating the Lord's table that would come. And we read again, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth with me, dwelleth in me, and I in him. Jesus, of course, was speaking figuratively about belief. As St. Augustine uh, com- commented, believe, and you have eaten. It's that simple. The great emphasis of Christ's hard saying in this text was that having eternal life involves a real partaking of Jesus through faith which at best can be understood by this indelicate metaphor of ingesting his body and blood. Christ's choice words were dramatized, to say the least, and this idea that he presents in verse number 54 is kind of vulgar. Whosoever eats my flesh. The vulgar word used there is munching or crunching. Could you imagine? It describes a violent death. A violent death he would willingly partake in. Laying down his life as a sheep before his shearer is dumb. So he opened not his mouth so we could open ours and partake by believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouth that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In a way, he is saying those who truly partake of Christ are crunching him, crunching his flesh. And we must truly feed on Christ or there is no life, regardless of what we have to say. To those who have not yet believed on Christ, this is a hard saying that demands that he be as real to them spiritually as something that they can eat. I say at the risk of sounding religiously impious. But he must be as real and as useful to us as any meal that we would consume. Is he that real to you? 
Again, at great risk, I say, have you sunk your teeth into Christ and tasted to see that he is good? For too many people, he's far less than real, fictitious, fantastic, but not real. The metaphor tells us that Jesus Christ is and must be absolutely indispensable to our lives. Bread was a staple of life in those days. They prayed daily for their bread demands to be met. And spiritually, it is absolutely impossible to live without Christ. Don't try to do it. He is our bread, our all, our everything. There's a man by the name of Dr. Charles Malik who was the one-time Secretary General of the United Nations. And once, while standing at the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, he stood on those steps and he proclaimed this, and I quote, I can live without food, without drink, without sleep, without air, but I cannot live without Jesus. That's what the church proclaims to itself and to those outside when we make Jesus Christ everything, when we proclaim that he is indispensable. Please do not attempt to live this life without Jesus. Certainly you cannot go to heaven without him, but you can't go anywhere without me, he said. Ye can do nothing. Through this divinely instituted parable of the Lord's table, we we proclaim four realities. We proclaim salvation, that apart from the redemptive blood of Christ, we are eternally separated from God and we are lost. We proclaim life, that we believe in the death, resurrection, exaltation, and bodily return of Jesus Christ. We proclaim dependence, that without Jesus we cannot live, and without him we dare not even try. And we proclaim hope. That Jesus' words recorded here in verse 25 of our text are absolutely true. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until, until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. We have hope in Christ. And having therefore made these blessed proclamations and affirmations, let us prepare our hearts to receive the bread and the cup. As we all stand to our feet, I invite you into a moment of reflection to pray. In just a moment, we'll have some servers prepare to distribute the elements. But here in this moment, would you dedicate your life Once again, perhaps in a specific area, as the Lord has led you through his spirit and the scriptures to say to yourself, I will rejoice in the bread and in the cup. Once again, I will take this moment to give thanks for both. I will proclaim my hope, my dependence, my life and my salvation through Jesus Christ and give thanks for that. As the piano begins to play, I invite you to take these moments to make your own proclamations in your heart as the Lord leads you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We affirm in our hearts and with our mouth that you are our salvation, our life, our dependence, and our hope. And Father, as we rejoice over these truths, the precious promises that you've given us, I pray, Lord, that you will help us 
as sojourners and pilgrims in this foreign land of earth. God, lead us to that heavenly city. Help us to rejoice over the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Help us to find our life in the bread, his very body. And God, help us to live victoriously, that you may be glorified on this earth. Not just that we may be better, though we thank you for that, but that your name is proclaimed with confidence and boldness to the glory and honor that is due to you. God, we praise you and thank you and rejoice over your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. At this time, we'll have a couple of our men distribute the elements. And as they're doing that, I would encourage you to, um, as you receive those elements, those of you with younger children, if you would prefer for them to not partake, um, that is at your discretion. Parents, I leave it to you. Certainly, if you have been saved and baptized, uh, that would be uh, the biblical um, requirements for partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, nevertheless, uh, for those that may be younger in age, parents, that is at your discretion, even if they have been saved and baptized. As the elements are being distributed here, the bread will be passed around first. And if you please, I will read Mark chapter 14, verses 22 through 26, the text that we just read. As we prepare once again our hearts for the elements. <clears throat> and as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And as Paul instructed his Followers, the Church of Corinth, we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Let us all partake of the bread. As the gentlemen prepare the next element, let's all pray together. We praise you, O Lord, sovereign of the world, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. And we praise you, dear Lord, for the bread of life that came from heaven. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. And as we are united in him, we thank God that we can be united with you, our Father, and with one another. By your grace, lead us into love and peace with one another as we give you thanks for the body, for the life of Jesus Christ. May we glorify him and you as we live this life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The gentleman will continue to distribute the elements.
Let us drink the juice together. Let us pray. We praise you, O Lord, our benevolent Father, who is merciful and just. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that has been shed for many and that has been shed to forgive us of our sins. We thank you for the peace that we have through him, through his precious blood. And Lord, as we are partakers of his life and his death and resurrection, we give you thanks that we know you through him. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now receive the benediction. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you.